some people. So many people may not understand this because our minds have been colonized to look at the food on a plate as some happy ending. For a cow to give you milk, a cow has to be pregnant all the time. That cow is forced to be pregnant and that cow's baby is usually taken away many times. The, the cow just doesn't even see their baby after a few minutes of giving birth, taken away, sold, turned into veal. And a lot of us um, on the Sister Vegan Project, we're all you know, women of African descent, we thought this was like, hello, isn't this what was done to our people? Um, why should we even let this happen? Why should we let, even if it's not a human, that this happening to, what makes this right? And these are the things that I've been thinking about when I think about, would you harbor me? What does it take to go beyond just myself, my community, my human community? And look at the connections and really think about what Angela Davis has said. And she's talking about how can we be successful, understand what does it take to overturn the 1%? What does it take? And when she talks about non-human animals, and she talks about how this movement cannot be successful without just you know, integrating feminism and anti-sexism and anti-racism, but also the non-human animal component. And then I bring it back to us sister vegans thinking about, you know, wow, I can't believe the suffering that cows go through. I cannot believe this. I'm not making this up. If you look at any documentaries or any film that show what happens when a cow gives birth, there, there's a connection there, there is love, you know, they're not these commodities without feelings. Um, chickens, when you eat chickens or chicken eggs, if you do. I don't think people realize that if it's many times when a male chicken is born, they throw the chickens away in a big bucket in a, a trash receptacle, alive. Because it's a commodity that they cannot use because the chicken is not a female. And people may not understand that. And these are kind of the things when I'm trying to decolonize my mind and really start thinking about how my mind had been colonized. At the time that I was doing my black feminist activism, I was so focused on that community, human beings, that it never occurred to me while I went out to do my work and then come home and maybe you know, eat a cheese pizza, never occurred to me. And I'm lactose intolerant anyway, so I'm been doing that anyway. You know, it just never occurred to me but why? Why is it, it didn't occur to me to 10 years later that that's what was happening? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, okay. So these are the things I'm talking about when I sing that song, Would You Harbor Me? This concept of solidarity. And I want to offer to people, I know veganism seems extreme, so I'm not actually saying, oh, go vegan overnight, immediately. I understand things like environmental racism. I understand the lack of access to particular foods. What I'm actually offering is to think more critically about, once again, how capitalism has colonized our minds and how we don't think so critically about commodities that come to us. And when we're engaging in our social justice, or in particular food justice and health activism, how has being, for most of us, first world privileged nationals, which is based on consumer capitalist culture, you know, we've been raised in this consumer capitalist culture. How has that actually affected how we fought with social justice, or food justice, or how we deal with any type of justice? And how do we start thinking of harboring all people, and not thinking that, well, I can only look at my own community because there's limited resources. And when we have that mindset of, it's, you know, limited resources, I can only focus on my own, think about how, who gave you that narrative of limited resources? Could it possibly be those that benefit from colonialism and capitalism to keep us all disenfranchised, to keep us all from sort of understanding solidarity, coming together to fight the 1%? So these are the things that I want to share with you through song and Sweet Honey and the Rock. I've got one more. Does anyone know the time, by the way? Okay. No more auction for me. No more, no more, no 
Sweet Honey the Rock, their rendition. I love them. When I first heard this, I think I just like started crying. So once again, I'm taking you know, the theory that I read, the narratives I read about black people, about being a slave, and I just heard it. And I thought, oh my God, that's what they meant. And then 10 years later, I'm thinking, it's not just human beings, I'm thinking of, you know, there are human beings that are still on the auction blocks. So there are a lot of people here who like chocolate. <coughs> and I started thinking about just past particular things like non-human animal products when I was entering my veganism, but also particular products that come to me through human slavery. So a lot of people may not actually realize that chocolate, unless it's indicated fair trade, and fair trade means that those that harvested the chocolate usually did it in a place and in an environment in which they were not exploited, they're not enslaved, and they're given livable wages. Most of the chocolate comes from the Ivory Coast in Africa, and child labor provides the chocolate that most of the West eats. Um, this is not two, three hundred years ago, this is now. And many of these children, they're enslaved, they have been abducted and forced to harvest the world's chocolate. So when I think about this song, I'm thinking, well yes, for black people here in America, there is no more auction block. <coughs> no more auction block for me, but what about the others? What about the child who's forced to harvest my chocolate? And we think more about this cotton. Much of the Uzbekistani children are forced to harvest the world's cotton. Cotton, the fabric of our lives. Whose lives? When I think of the song that I just sang to you, this concept of the auction block, and thinking about, well, slavery has not ended. People are enslaved to bring me these commodities. And then we think past just the slavery it takes to bring these commodities to us, but how am I enslaved, mentally enslaved? And how does that result in me not being able to understand how to find health and harm, sorry, food and health and harmony together with my own body and community? How am I a slave to these ideologies that corporate capitalism has been feeding to me? How has it enslaved my health? How has it enslaved my ability to become a liberator of my own self? So as you can see, I'm interested in kind of solidarity and making all the connections. And I didn't see that when I was younger. I didn't understand that. I didn't have, I didn't have the resources. I didn't have the particular mentors that I needed to do that. And I'm here today to kind of share that with the younger generation. I don't know if the younger generation isn't here, but adults who talk to the younger generation. Kind of share that and plant those seeds. And think about ways in which I may perpetuate suffering when I think I'm liberating my community. And I mean that by, you know, my community's having problems economically, so we're going to go and raise money through m &Ms, you know and not knowing that the chocolate that got to me was from enslaved children 10,000 miles away. So how can we support our own local communities in terms of food and health justice and activism and not at the expense of people that look just like us 10,000 miles away? So thank you for your time and I'm hoping that you guys move later to the show if you have questions and concerns always feel free to email me, but I say that I have, you know, two very young children, so I don't necessarily respond quick enough, but I will respond. So, thank you. I don't know, uh, who's here? Um, yeah, is there, a, is there a comments and questions section, or is there? Yes, there, people okay. have questions. Comments. I know. Did we have to turn on the house lights? I can do like this. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Oh, someone. No? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, have yeah. I just wanted to, uh, my, uh, my encounters, my first encounters with veganism, um, are probably very different from most people. Um, everyone that I know is a vegan.
I mean, you know, one black person is a person who, who's a vegan. And it has always really struck me as individual people of color taking the opportunity to, to regain some of their power. And maybe just talk a little bit more from your perspective and from your journey. Uh, talk a little bit about that, that empower, that recognizing your own power through the opportunity, seizing the opportunity to remove yourself from the marketplace, right? And I think that maybe to and use that to frame some of the some of the other things that you said. The whole thing is amazing, but just a little bit about veganism and power. 